Francisco at the Search Engines Strategies Conference at Moscone Center. Here with BJ Fogg, who is the director of the Persuasive Technology Lab at Stanford University, and uh, just delivered a, a fascinating uh, keynote address that talked about hot triggers in various media. So I want to talk about the future of mobile devices as a persuasion platform. We've seen uh, smartphones and then uh, the iPad and then who knows what the future is. Tell yeah. us what, wh how you see it from where you are. Yeah. So from my view as a psychologist, uh, it's not so much about the embodiment of the technology but the experience that mobile can bring to people. So it doesn't matter to me whether it's this big or this big or what have you. Uh, from a psychological perspective, an uh -huh. experience perspective, it means that that device can help me or change my behavior or influence me in the day-to-day -day, uh, daily routines of my life, whether I'm at the grocery store, the gym, on the river, what have you. Uh, and that's very different than having to be at a keyboard with a screen and so yeah. on. Uh, it, it, it can be more spontaneous, for one thing. Yeah, and targeted to what I'm doing. So the Greeks had a word... Uh, concept called Kairos, mm -hmm. which is, uh, it's basically the right timing for mm -hmm. persuasion. And when it comes to pers persuasion and behavior change, timing matters a lot. And so these mobile devices are more able to do that kind of thing, time the trigger, time the request, time what have you, when I can do it, when I'm in a location mm -hmm. that's appropriate for it, and so on. Whereas something like email, if my email is telling me to go exercise and it's two in the morning, that's not useful. But see, a good mobile system wouldn't be doing that. We know that at two in the morning I'm not going to run out and exercise and that it should be triggering me to do those things when I can do it, when the gym's open and when, I'm, when I've exercised in the past. Do you think, uh, looking into the crystal ball of the future, do you think that mobile devices are going to replace uh, for at least a big part of the population, laptops and desktops? Hmm, it's a good question. I, I think that line is blurring. It I, is blurring. I, I, I think right now, at least with my students, and it's, it's great to work with young people because you kind of get to see what's going to uh, diffuse through the rest of, not always, but usually they're ahead of the curve a little bit. They all have laptops. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have a desktop? Yeah, maybe some of the programmers, right. maybe the people that need that processing power for graphics, but they all also have laptops. So first of all, that's a given. Where's the line between laptop and iPad, laptop and tablet and phone? That's all going to get really blurry. I, I think what's interesting to me about mobile is it's the future is we will always have a device with us that will connect mm -hmm. to the internet, that will connect us to our social network, our friends, and will be... Um, position to influence us um, through either a database, a kind of a smart recommendation mm. system, or through our friends, or, or through applications we run. So it's sort of like humans, human beings we've changed. We've actually reached the next stage of evolution where mobile is the next physiological change in our lives because everybody coming into the world will have a mobile phone with them and they will live a mobile device, whatever we call it, and they'll have it throughout their lives. So I'm pushing this idea, it's a little extreme, but why not try it on, that we have changed physically, physiologic, uh, physically, and the mobile phone is the next step in human evolution. All right. Thanks so much for sharing with us. Tell me about the, the, the research you're doing yeah. at your laboratory. What we're working on in the lab is we're creating models of behavior and behavior change that are both accurate, but also simple enough to take action. So if, um, if, if somebody's working with a brand or a startup or a nonprofit and they want to change behavior in a certain way, they can use our tools to understand how to do that uh, and how to succeed and measure and iterate along those lines. So it's really about empowering people, and we hope good people in the world, to make a difference. <laughs> now, if someone wanted to, to look at the research that you're doing, give me a couple of URLs they could look at. Yeah, well, right now the easiest way, and we're relatively new to this, uh, we decided to start a Facebook page where we'll be pretty transparent about what we're doing in our lab. So if you go to facebook.com slash captology, C-A-P-T-O-L-O-G-Y, um, that's where we're sharing All videos right. and slides and so on. Certainly bjfog.com. I don't update that as much as I should. That Follow me on Twitter at bjfog. Um, and then our lab's website, captology.stanford.edu. Those would probably be the ways. It's really hard to communicate with you, isn't it? Well, you know, there's, yeah, there's, um, 
you know, the whole, it's, it's a shifting landscape. It is, you know? it is. Uh, what we're not doing is pushing out all our lives work through Twitter because we think that audience is very ephemeral and doesn't persist. Whereas Facebook page, and this was a recent decision, hmm. it does last and people can go back through the history. Whereas on Twitter, it's kind of like you put it out there and it vanishes. Mm -hmm. So we, we'll do that eventually, but the emphasis is more on uh, let's create um, like two minute videos and short slide presentations and post them to Facebook so people can use them in their work. Thanks so much for sharing this. Sure. This is Ralph Wilson. Web one.